Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The principles of trial length determination remain the same regardless of tooth type or number of root canals. The purpose of this procedure is to determine reproducible lengths from which to biomechanically prepare each involved root canal. Differences in procedures for trial length determination in posterior teeth versus anterior teeth are attributed to the high degree of curvature in many of these canals. Trial length determination can be thought of as a sequence of length estimation, measurement and pre-curving of instruments, insertion of instruments, recording trial length values and corresponding reference points, and securing a radiograph of the instruments in place. Our demonstration will be done on a maxillary molar. This tooth has been previously mounted in a typodont and an occlusal access cavity prepared. Presently, the tooth has been radiographed and isolated with the rubber dam. The first step is to make a length estimation. This is best accomplished using a preoperative or diagnostic radiograph. A radiograph used in this manner should be free of any gross distortions so to increase accuracy. In our case, the buccal roots have been foreshortened. This should be corrected for when making a length estimation we will be measuring the mesial buccal canal. The finger ruler is positioned adjacent the root canal image and a length to approximate the apical constriction or cementodentinal junction is estimated. This estimated length is next transferred to an appropriate size endodontic file. In this case, we will use a number 15 size file. The file is held against the ruler so to move the instrument stop to the correct position, transferring the straight length. When the involved root canal evidences curvature, the file should be pre-curved to a corresponding configuration. In this case, aseptic technique is maintained using the tray setup towel as an insulator while pre-curving the file. Observe how the instrument curvature now approximates that evidenced on the preoperative radiograph. The instrument is now ready for insertion into the root canal. Initial entry into the root canal is best accomplished when the file tip approaches the canal orifice from an opposite direction. This can be demonstrated using an extracted tooth with its crown section. The mesial buccal canal is approached from the distal lingual, the distal buccal canal from the mesial lingual, the palatal canal from the buccal, and the mesial lingual canal from the distal buccal. It is also advantageous to have irrigant in the pulp chamber to act as a lubricant. It may be necessary to use the instrument curvature in a non-anatomical orientation when first approaching the canal orifice. Thereafter, the instrument should be reoriented to an anatomical position during insertion. Insertion is complete when the instrument stop approximates its reference point. In this case, the mesial buccal cusp tip is used as a reference point. In the event that a number 10 instrument cannot be wiggled in this manner, the instrument stop should be repositioned, the length remeasured, and the instrument reinserted. These procedures have been repeated for each canal of this maxillary molar so that all canals have instruments inserted to their respective estimated lengths and reference points. At this time, all trial length records should be completed. Each canal should have a corresponding trial length measurement and reference point recorded on the packet as shown. The final step in this procedure is taking a radiograph with all files in place. We will use a paralleling technique shooting straight from the buckle 
in an attempt to attain images of all three root apices, the palatal apex being between the other two. Here is an example of an X-ray cone dot and the film oriented allowing such a projection. Let's look at the secured trial length radiograph. It is this along with our recorded trial length estimates with which the biomechanical preparation lengths will be determined. These corrected lengths should be recorded on the packet as shown, the final lengths being circled. In the event that any correction was greater than two millimeters, these procedures should be repeated using the corrected lengths as estimates. Silver cone root fillings are used in selected cases only. They are usually reserved for narrow curved canals, such as mesial canals of mandibular molars or buccal canals of maxillary molars. The purpose of any biomechanical preparation procedure is to clean the root canal space of pulpal debris and to shape the root canal space for the appropriate filling material. A preparation for a silver cone requires roundness and parallelism. Our demonstration will be done on the mesial buccal canal of a maxillary molar. The tooth has been isolated with the rubber dam and has had its temporary filling removed. Previous packet entries and radiographs are available. Biomechanical preparation procedures can be broken down into three elements adjustment of files, irrigation, and actual filing. Files should be adjusted in two ways, pre-curving and transfer of working length. The trial length radiograph can be used as an aid in the pre-curving of files. Here the pre-curving is done using the towel of the tray setup as an insulator to preserve aseptic technique. The first file can be pre-curved and matched to the trial length radiograph. Thereafter, this file can be used as a pattern for pre-curving the rest of the files. Realize that in the course of filing, it may become necessary to re-pre-curve the instruments. This is especially true with the stiffer, larger files. At this time, the working length can be transferred to the file. We will start with the number 15 size file. The file is held in such a way as to press the curve straight against the ruler. The file is then pushed to move the stop to the desired position. In this manner, the straight length is measured, which is a reproducible measure. In some cases, after this, it may become necessary to reinforce pre-curving. Now some irrigant is placed in the pulp chamber and the file is inserted in such a way so that the curve of the file is maintained and matches that of the root canal. Filing is now initiated in a wet environment with a consciousness of the canal curvature. The filing stroke is an in and out motion confluent with the arc of the canal curvature. This helps to maintain the original curve of the canal while increasing its width. During the filing, Lateral flaring pressures should be minimized in that a paralleled preparation is desired for a silver cone. Also, there should be no rotation of the files during instrumentation. Rotation and or forcing of instruments in curved canals can lead to three undesirable phenomena, zipping, ledging, and perforation. Let's examine these more closely in some diagrams. Zipping is a phenomenon which occurs when a file is overextended out the apical foramen of a curved canal and the canal is straightened. The pivot point where forces change in distribution is termed the elbow. Coronal to this point, forces act so that the file strips the inside curvature. Apical to the elbow, the forces act so that the file zips the apical foramen. 
This results in a teardrop tearing of the apical foramen. The teardrop shape is a reflection of the canal becoming more straight as larger files are used incorrectly. As can be seen, the resultant canal shape is hourglass-like, with the narrowest diameter occurring at the elbow rather than at the apical extent of the preparation. A similar phenomenon, called ledging, occurs when the file remains within the tooth. At this point, there would have been a loss of working length. If the files are forced in an effort to regain length, a perforation could result. In all these situations, the attainment of an apical seal most likely would be compromised due to the distortion of the apical canal shape. Returning to the filing, there are some generalizations which should be kept in mind when instrumenting. Instruments should be used in sequence without skipping any file size regardless of ease of manipulation of previous files. The file should be used until it is loose, almost floating in the canal, before advancing in size. At this point, the canal should be irrigated so that the larger file will not plunge debris apically. When the larger file is tried and doesn't go to place, one should immediately return to the smaller file to prevent any irreversible damage. Returning to smaller files, along with frequent irrigation at any time during biomechanical preparation, helps prevent canal blockages. Using these principles, the canal is enlarged to the desired size. As this enlargement process proceeds, you should check for the development of an apical stop. If no such stop can be demonstrated after instrumenting with a size 20 file, the trial length determination should be questioned and a new radiograph attained with the larger instruments in place. It is generally accepted that a minimum of a size 25 file is necessary to adequately prepare and fill a root canal. One rule of thumb calls to enlarge the canal at least two sizes beyond that which first binds the canal walls. Subsequent procedures are enhanced if the final instrument is fit snugly in the canal rather than used until loose. In our example, the canal was instrumented with a size 25 file until a size 30 file fits snugly to length. The file should exhibit an apical stop. There should be no apical progression of the file when its handle is tapped. Another concept which should be kept in mind is that many times curved canal instrumentation experiences a small loss of length during the biomechanical enlargement of the canal. This is a result of a shortening of the distance from the apical terminus of the preparation to the reference point due to a loss of some of the inside curvature of the canal. When all canals of the tooth are considered complete, the files are put to place and a radiograph is taken to verify the preparation. This is done using similar techniques as that used for the trial length radiograph. The radiograph is examined for apical termination and maintenance of canal curvature. The adaptation of trial points is an important step in preparing for the filling of the root canal space. Many times any difficulties during this procedure will indicate some inadequacy in the biomechanical preparation. The purpose of trial point adaptation is to fit a silver cone into the prepared root canal space such that two criteria are met, insertion to the working length and attainment of significant resistance to withdrawal turned tugback. Our demonstration will be done on a mesial buccal canal of a maxillary molar. The canal has been previously prepared 
so that a number 30 size file fits snugly to length. The tooth has been isolated with the rubber dam and has had its temporary filling removed. The majority of the time, trial point adaptation is done immediately prior to filling. This appointment usually follows that of biomechanical preparation. The first step, then, is to reestablish the final file to length in the root canal. The canal is irrigated, and a pre-curved, measured file is reestablished to length. Once assured that no blockages are present, and the biomechanical preparation is correct, the root canal space must be dried of all irrigant. This helps prevent any induced silver corrosion, which could ultimately affect the apical seal of the root canal. Paper points are aseptically transferred from the instrument box to the towel setup. Next, they are used individually until the root canal is dry. A silver cone corresponding to the last size file is selected, in this case a number 30. The working length is transferred to the silver cone using a finger ruler and a hemostat for grasping at the working length. The silver cone is then inserted to the reference point using judicious pressure so not to buckle it. The silver cone should be wedged to place when proper fitting is achieved. Generally, once inserted, if silver cone removal is difficult or impossible with cotton forceps, then the tugback is adequate. Usually, some adjustment will be necessary due to lack of tugback. If this is so, one half to one millimeter increments should be cut off the apical end of the silver cone, each time rechecking for length and tugback. Now the silver cone should be adapted correctly, and the coronal excess can be clipped off at the reference point. After all the master cones are adapted in their respective canals, this is checked with a radiograph. The radiographic image should be comparable to that of the biomechanical preparation radiograph. Obturation of the root canal space is the final step of root canal treatment. When the previous steps have been done correctly, this step should be completed with relative ease. The purpose of this procedure is to completely obturate the entire root canal space with a combination of the silver cone, sealer, and accessory gutta percha cones. Our demonstration will be done on the mesial buccal canal of a maxillary molar. The canal has been previously prepared for a cone, and the cone has been adapted. As recommended, in this case, the trial point adaptation has immediately preceded this step. The tooth is isolated with the rubber dam, the canal is dry, and the trial point is located in a designated area under the towel setup. Now we are ready to fill the root canal. Sealer is mixed on a glass slab to a smooth consistency that can be drawn up with a spatula one inch. The sealer is applied in small amounts with the file smaller than that last used to the working length. Once the file is seated to place, it is rotated counterclockwise to help release the sealer to the canal walls. This is repeated as often as necessary, avoiding the application of an excessive amount of sealer. The silver cone is again grasped firmly with the hemostat and dipped in a small amount of sealer. The silver cone is now inserted slowly into the canal using a slight back and forth motion. Pausing at intervals will allow pressure to equalize, reducing the possibility of periapical sealer extrusion. 
When the silver cone begins to meet resistance, complete the insertion by grasping it below the level of the reference point in the pulp chamber. Slowly seat the silver cone to the reference point. When space exists around the coronal aspect of the silver cone, accessory gutta percha cones are laterally condensed in this area. Once all the canals are filled correctly, a carpet of gutta percha is placed on the pulp chamber floor. The sealer is wiped out of the chamber. The chamber filled with zinc state cement. The cement cut down to cap separation depth. The silver ends recessed. And the cap filled with cavit. A final radiograph is taken and compared to that of the trial point. Post-preparation is a common procedure used in the reconstruction of some endodontically treated teeth. When endodontically treated maxillary anterior teeth are in need of full crown restoration, a post and core fabrication is usually also indicated. This is due to the lack of remaining supportive tooth structure once endodontic and crown preparation procedures have been completed. When considering any type of post-preparation, four general considerations must be addressed. The need for a retentive post in the restoration, the maintenance of the integrity of the apical seal, the type of post to be used, and any ridiculous anatomy restrictions. In our example, we will prepare post room in a maxillary central incisor, which has been previously cut down incisally to simulate a broken down crown. The anticipated restorative procedures are a cast post and core followed by a full porcelain to metal crown. This establishes the need for a tapered post preparation so to allow for the establishment of a line of draw. The post preparation procedure involves two steps, removal of gutta percha and actual preparation of the canal. During each of these steps, one must consider the appropriate depth of preparation in maintaining the integrity of the apical seal and accommodating radicular anatomy. At least five millimeters of well-condensed undisturbed gutta percha must remain apical to assure an apical seal. In that a cast post and core's retention is reliant on length, we will leave the minimal five millimeter amount of gutta percha in the apical portion of the canal. The depth is estimated using the recorded measurements off the endodontic packet or a radiograph showing the tooth with a completed endodontic fill. Radicular anatomy restrictions such as curvatures, proximal root concavities, and lateral canals as well as of radicular structure must also be considered. Once these elements have been considered, the post-preparation procedures can be initiated. The tooth is isolated with the rubber dam to enhance removal of gutta percha and safeguard against any endodontic violation. Gutta percha is removed with a heated Michigan number 25 plugger, not a rotary instrument. The appropriate end of the plugger is heated in the Bunsen burner then plunged into the canal, removed immediately, and wiped clean with a gauze. This is repeated as many times as is necessary until the desired depth is reached. This depth estimate is monitored using the millimeter finger ruler adjacent to the plugger shaft and an established reference point. Caution must be taken so not to wedge the plugger end against the canal walls and fracture the root. If wedging occurs, a number three spreader should be substituted as the gutta percha is removed to the desired level. The coronal end of the remaining apical gutta percha plug 
can be vertically tamped while still warm to further condense this material. The created space can be seen on this demonstration radiograph. This will now act as a pilot hole for further preparation of the canal walls with rotary instruments. We will use safe-ended piezo reamers sequentially to prevent end cutting and deviations within the root. These are used in a similar fashion as anodonic files in a circumferential manner to flare the post space. In this way, the next size instrument should be able to fit passively to length if necessary. It is of utmost importance that some system of monitoring the burr's length in the canal is controlled. Susceptible perforation areas such as proximal concavities should be favored, decreasing dentin removal in these areas. Widening of the canal space should not be excessive. Retention of the restoration is worthless if the structural strength of the tooth is reduced to the point of inviting fracture of the root. Canal preparation width should be dictated by the limitations of post and core fabrication procedures. Retention should suffice through accuracy of approximating parts and post length. The puzzle fit cementation of a post and core provides great resistance to dislodgement while post length helps prevent susceptibility to root fracture. Here is a radiograph of the tooth after post preparation. Notice the extent of the remaining endodontic filling. Post preparation is a common procedure used in the reconstruction of some endodontically treated teeth. When endodontically treated molars are in need of full crown restoration, a post retained amalgam buildup is many times also indicated. This need for post retention is due to the lack of remaining secure tooth structure once endodontic and crown preparation procedures have been completed. When considering any type of post preparation, four general considerations must be addressed. The need for a retentive post in the restoration, the maintenance of the integrity of the apical seal, the type of post to be used, and any radicular anatomy restrictions. In our example, we will prepare post room in a maxillary first molar using the larger palatal canal to retain the post. The anticipated restorative procedures are a post-retained amalgam buildup followed by a full gold crown. This establishes the need for a post used in an anti-parallel fashion. The post-preparation procedure involves two steps, removal of gutta percha and actual preparation of the canal. During each of these steps, one must consider the appropriate depth of preparation in maintaining the integrity of the apical seal and accommodating radicular anatomy. At least five millimeters of well-condensed, undisturbed gutta percha must remain apically to assure an apical seal. A post used in an anti-parallelism fashion will be cemented to place so to create a positional undercut with the remaining walls of the tooth cavity and or other posts or pins. Intimate fitting posts used in this manner require only five to seven millimeters of post length to provide adequate retention. The curvatures usually seen in molar roots make this type of shorter post restoration desirable in preventing root perforations. Proximal root concavities, lateral canals, and maintenance of radicular structure must also be considered. A radiograph showing the tooth with a completed endodontic fill should be examined closely
prior to initiating post-preparation procedures. Once these elements have been considered, the post-preparation procedures can be initiated. The tooth is isolated with the rubber dam to enhance removal of the gutta percha and safeguard against any endodontic violation. The gutta percha is removed with a heated Michigan number 25 plugger, not a rotary instrument. The appropriate end of the plugger is heated in the Bunsen burner, then plunged into the canal, removed immediately, and wiped clean with a gauze. This is repeated as many times as necessary until the desired depth is reached. This depth estimate is monitored using the millimeter finger ruler adjacent to the plugger shaft and an established reference point. Caution must be taken so not to wedge the plugger end against the canal walls and fracture the root. If wedging occurs, a number three spreader should be substituted as the heated instrument until the desired depth is reached. The coronal end of the remaining apical gutta percha plug can be vertically tamped while still warm to further condense this material. The created space can be seen on this demonstration radiograph. This will now act as a pilot hole for further preparation of the canal walls with rotary instruments. We will use drills of the parapost system. These are end cutting drills and should be used with the utmost care. The drills are used sequentially to take maximum advantage of the pilot hole concept. It is important that some system of monitoring the burr's length in the canal is controlled. In this case, the silicone stops from endodontic files are used. Widening of the canal space should only continue to the smallest size which creates the shape which intimately accommodates the post shape of the system. Here are radiographs of the tooth after post preparation with and without the post in place. Notice how all previous considerations have not been violated. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.